If you consider yourself a prepper and you have not read one second after, are you really a prepper? Hey guys, T2, welcome back to the Titan Preparedness Channel. In today's video, I want to talk about one of the best prepper fiction books that I've ever read. Before we get into this video, number one, of course, like, comment, subscribe, and share. As always, I greatly appreciate it. Number two, of course, when talking about a book, there's going to be some spoilers. So if you've not read the book, uh, don't watch this video. If you have read the book, watch the video and see if you've learned the same lessons that I did or if there's other lessons that maybe you learned that I didn't. Make sure you leave those down in the comment section. So the third thing is that this video is going to be a two-parter. Today's video and I'll release another video on Wednesday about the same subject. I was just going to do one video and do the top five things that I learned, but there's just so much information in this book, it'd be disrespectful for me to just to do the top five. So the book is called One Second After, and the basic storyline is there's a guy named John Matherson. He is a retired U.S. Army colonel who is now teaching at the local university up in Black Mountain, North Carolina. He moved to Black Mountain, North Carolina to be with his wife's family as she was dying. So at the beginning of the story, you learn that John has two daughters, a 16-year-old and a 12-year-old. The 12-year-old happens to be celebrating her birthday on the day of the event. And she's got the music cranked up. He's on the phone with one of his buddies up in Washington, who happens to be a three-star general. Was like, hey man, something's going on, something's not right. And the phone cuts off. At the same time that the phone shuts off, the power shuts off, the fan shut off, the music shuts off. And they think, okay, basic power outage. His town, Black Mountain, is located 16 miles outside of Asheville, North Carolina. And it has an interstate that runs behind his house about half a mile to a mile away. So again, they're thinking, ah, oh, basic power outage, nothing to it, nothing to worry about. Well, that's kind of when they start putting the pieces together. Because they start noticing, well, you, you don't hear the traffic from the interstate. All the vehicles are stalled out in the middle of the road. There's no planes flying over. There's no street lights on. So what could cause all of this to happen? The story follows John and his family as they endure an EMP from a small Christian community college mountain town. It's probably the best prepper book that I've ever read. And yes, it is prepper fiction. However, it's not full fiction, if you know what I mean. Like when we talk prepper fiction, people think radiated spiders and mutants and zombies. It, it has none of that. The most fictional thing about this book is that an EMP sets off. And so everything that you see in this book might actually or could actually happen if this event did occur. So yes, it is prepper fiction, but it's not super prepper fiction, if you know what I mean. Let's go over the first five lessons that I learned from reading One Second After. So number 10, desperate people do desperate things slash people will do anything for food. So if the power shuts off, if an EMP did occur, food and food production and food procurement are going to be some of the top things on anyone's list. Most people will do just about anything for food. So on day 35, there's a lady named Carol. She happens to be on the interstate. They've got the interstate blocked off, shut down, and they're letting people funnel through to go into the next town, to go up the road, just kind of to get them away from their own borders. She walks past John, who happens to be kind of overseeing everything, and she's like, man, I will, I will sleep with you. I will do whatever you want me to, as long as you give me a place to stay and some food for my stomach. And that was the first time that John, the main character, had ever seen that. He hadn't been on the interstate, he hadn't been patrolling the border, so to speak. And here this lady is offering herself just for a meal and a place to stay. And she's not the only person in the book that is like that. So one of the events that really plays into part, the desperate people do desperate things, 
is when Asheville, North Carolina and Black Mountain, North Carolina get into a fight. Asheville wants to send 10 to 20 to 30,000 people to Black Mountain because Asheville cannot take care of these people. And so the folks over in Black Mountain told the Asheville people, listen, if you send those folks our way, we're going to shut off the water main. The pipes are in Black Mountain. They feed water to Asheville. The folks in Black Mountain said, we will blow these pipes and all of your people will die of dehydration. Do I think that I would be able to blow a pipe and kill thousands of people? No. You have to threaten to kill tens of thousands of people to save your own people. And so, very desperate times, very desperate measures. People will do anything for food also falls into that. One of the best jobs to have during this entire book was Grave Digger. The Grave Diggers ended up getting double rations and then later on in the book, triple rations. So people will do anything for food, including dealing with dead bodies. Number nine, count the little victories. There's not a lot of happy moments. There's not a lot of hip hip hoorays. There's not a lot of feel good type scenarios in this book. However, these people in Black Mountain were not nearly as affected as others around the country. At the beginning of the book, when the EMP hits, John just happens to have a Ford Etzel sitting in his driveway. Now that old Ford Etzel is one of the only vehicles to still run in the entire town. Now eventually they do start getting more and more vehicles. They get a couple Volkswagens up and running, they get a couple mopeds up and running, eventually they get a fire truck up and running, and they also make forward progress. So they end up running a telephone wire between them, Swannanoa, and from them to Asheville. And so you have to remember, yeah, the world's going to crap, but count the little victories. Because if you down and depressed all the time, it's, it's not going to be good for your morale, it's not going to be good for your sanity. So having those, those little items that you know other people aren't having, such as a vehicle running, such as a fire truck up and operating, such as a telephone wire between you and 16 miles away, yeah, that's a pretty impressive victory. Number eight, there has to be law and order. Within the first couple chapters of this book, John Matherson goes from being, you know, a nice college professor, a little bit of war experience, to a cold-blooded killer. So a few days in, some local druggies break into the nursing home and they steal all of the pain medicine. They get high as a kite and now all the pain meds are gone. Well, there has to be punishment for that action. So John ends up having to murder these two local druggies. During the middle slash end of the book, there is an act of cannibalism in his own camp, in his own town. And it doesn't say how he had to punish him, but more than likely, you know, they ended up taking that guy out and shooting him. There was a few other accounts of people stealing food, didn't really say the punishment for him, but there has to be law and order. If you want the town to rebuild, if you want the town to work together, you have to have some sort of a law and order established. I'm not saying kill someone because they stole some food. You know, maybe go make them a grave digger for three days. Maybe skip their rations for the next two or three days. Or, in John's case, put a bullet in them. Depending on the severity of the crime depends on the punishment. But these people had to learn, if you break the rules, there will be punishment. Number seven, everything runs out eventually. Some of the things that ran out in this town was tobacco, alcohol, bullets, both pain meds and psychiatric medicine, propane, gasoline. I know a lot of us preppers talk about, oh, having all these barter items and stockpiling alcohol, stockpiling tobacco, stockpiling weed, whatever. The truth is it's going to run out eventually. In one of the paragraphs from the book, John mentions how he thought that tobacco was going to be a form of currency. Well, in this town, there's only really one convenience gas station. And once the power went off, yeah, they sold all of their smokes and all of their dip and all of their tobacco. And then it got used up. They ran out of alcohol. A lot of the town drunks 
used up all the alcohol. Now there's no more alcohol left. Bullets, especially 22 caliber and your small caliber hunting rifles, became a form of currency. So on day 63, two months after this event started, five bullets would get you either one rabbit or one squirrel. Then on day 131, the same squirrel would go for seven bullets and the same rabbit would actually go for 20 bullets. So as these stockpiles ran up and went dry, well, prices started going up. So make sure that you have other forms and other ways of doing the things. That way you can save your precious commodity. If you're a hunter and you're going out every day hunting, maybe don't carry a gun. Maybe take a bow and arrow, a slingshot, whatever you can get the job done with and save that ammo. He has a propane grill at the beginning of the book. Eventually the propane runs out. So having other methods to cook your food with would obviously be beneficial. Having something like the Go Sun solar oven or the All American Sun oven, that way you can save your precious resources for when you actually need them later on. So number six, the final one for this part one video. Sometimes no news is better than good news. Throughout the book, they start hearing this radio broadcast, and it's called The Voice of America. This broadcast is coming off of a U.S. Navy ship that is now returning to the coast of South Carolina and is going to start bringing supplies, is going to start bringing food, is going to start help rebuilding America. This Voice of America broadcast tells them information and, and really gets their hopes up. They tell them that out west, all the corn crops are coming in, all the wheat crops are coming in, they're going to start loading up trains and start delivering this food all throughout America. Well, it, it never really happens. Now John, Black Mountain, and the rest of his crew keep hearing this, this voice on the radio that says, help is coming for you. We are here. We are here to help. We are going to rebuild. Just hang on. And it takes almost a year for it to finally get there. In my opinion, if they hadn't heard that information, they would have never got their hopes up. Now, they still live life day to day, even after the hearing the information. But that little spark of hope quickly fades away with every passing day. And so if you're ever put in a situation like that, you know, you have to make the determining factor of, do you tell people what you heard on the radio and that help's coming? Or only a select few hear about it and those people keep it hush-hush, keep it quiet. During every hurricane event, during every tornado event, you know, the government's here to help. and We're going to help you out. We're going to send men out there to rescue you. How many days did people sit on the roof during Hurricane Katrina? How many times did they tell Puerto Rico that after Hurricane Maria hit? They didn't have power for over a year. Hearing this little spark of hope information is great, but take it with a grain of salt. Just because someone says they're coming to help you doesn't mean it's going to be anytime soon. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you tune in Wednesday for part two of this same time, one o'clock Eastern. And I hope if you've read the book, it gets you thinking. Again, post down in the comment section kind of things that you learned from reading this book. If you haven't read the book and you still watch the video, I greatly appreciate it. But maybe learning this information, you'll want to go read the book. I get no commission off the book, so whether you read it or not, I don't care. But it is a great prepper fiction book that I think every prepper should read. It really makes you think, what would I do if I was put in that situation? What would I do if that was my town that just got hit with an EMP? What would I do if the power was out for that long? Again, guys, I hope you tune in Wednesday for part two. Hope you guys have a good day. T2 out.